headed that way. Thank you for reminding me, Sister Jean. I'm still caught up in myself. I almost forgot. Has God been good to anybody else but me? Has God been good to anybody else? Because I do know that if it was not for him, I would not be here today. If it was not for him, I would not have what I have today. I'm more great. I, I need to be more grateful than what I am. We all can stand to be a little more grateful. Amen. 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 I'm going to uh, try. I'm setting my timer on this right now. Taylor had told me I'm on a time restraint of 25 minutes. She said, you go over, I'm shutting you down. She said, I would tell David to cut off the microphone. I said, well, honey, the joke's on you. I'm not enough to preach for that. <laughs> so, but we are, uh, we are going to try our best to get you out of here as quickly as possible because today is a holiday. And we ourselves have a five-hour drive we would like to make before it's dark. So be in prayer for us. But today, my subject is simply free. Free. Look at somebody and say free. Free. Get your Bibles and go to, we're going to be in two passages of Scripture. Go to Luke chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 17 first. And before I get any deeper into the Word, I want to pray one more time. And I ask you to put your hand, one hand over your heart if you have a hand free. And uh, I want to ask you to ask the Lord to speak to you and ask the Lord to anoint me today to be his vessel and that you'll hear his words and not mine. Father, today I thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and the opportunity to preach the unadulterated word of God. Today, Lord, I ask that every congregation member will have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Spirit is saying to the church. Today, Lord, I hide myself behind the cross. Lord, I ask you that you will use me as a vessel. Now, I pray that the words that come forth are not just words that are written on this paper, not just words that come out of my own mouth or my own thought process, but that come directly from the throne room of God. Lord, make this easy to preach, and I ask for the anointing today that will preach, that will break the yoke of bondage. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 17. And he, Jesus, was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now go to John chapter 8. We're going to read verse 32 through 36. And Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm sorry, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Today I simply want to talk about free. Today we all know what we are celebrating, the 4th of July, Independence Day, a very important day for our country. And while we celebrate today, there's a lot of other things that our minds are kind of thinking on. Some of you are, your thought process is going to what you're going to do this afternoon. If you're going to go find some fireworks or if you're going to have family over. And some of you are thinking about the barbecue. You're thinking about the watermelon. You're thinking about the ice cream. Can I get a witness? <laughs> uh, what's going to happen tonight? And some of you are sitting there thinking, God, I wonder how long he's going to preach today. I promise you, I'll try my best to be short. But one thing that is kind of on my mind, and it's kind of, you know, normal for a day like this, is freedom. All week long I've been thinking about freedom and what it means to be free. While our country has many faults, many, many, many faults, we still live in the land of the free. We still have rights and privileges that people in other nations and other countries would honestly kill to have. We have a freedom and we have liberty that our forefathers fought long and hard and that our men and women in foreign countries and the armed forces have fought to help us keep. 
And while our country may not be where most of us would want it to be, we still must be grateful that we had men and women come before us and we had our forefathers fight for our liberties because if they had not, there's no telling what our country would look like today. We live in the land of the free. We're in the land of the free because of the brave. And today we are celebrating the fact that we have the experience and we have the ability to attain life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the United States of America. Now, while we know, and most of us are familiar with why we, what Independence Day is, that we're free from oppression, we're free from the bondage of a foreign nation, what's funny is there's still a lot of people who are Americans, who were born Americans, that do not truly understand what it means to be free. It's kind of interesting to me how the mindset from our original founders has shifted so much to today that what they call freedom is not what we call freedom. There's a lot of individuals in our country today who really have not understood the true definition and the true concept of freedom because they believe somebody else's interpretation. Honestly, one of the biggest hindrances of Americans today is they're believing what the government tells them freedom is. Hello. We depend on that too much. And while, yes, there is a declaration of independence that they, uh, they, they swear to uphold, there are many who are really fighting to destroy that declaration of independence and the rights that our forefathers fought for us to have. There are many individuals in this country that because they depended so much on history books, they depended so much on what the government tells them and what history professors tell them, that they do not really have a grasp of what true freedom looks like. If you don't believe it, just look at the rights that are right that are being suppressed in our nation today. There are individuals who are trying to take away your Second Amendment right to bear arms. One of the forefathers said, when a government starts taking away the guns, that's no longer a government. That's a dictatorship. Just look at the government, some of those in higher officials trying to take away our freedom of religion. The church is under attack more now than ever in the land of the free. Don't tell me that there aren't individuals who don't understand what true freedom is. And while we may shake our heads and say it's, it's, it's crazy that there are Americans that don't understand what it means to be free, can I submit to you today that I believe there are Christians who are the same way? Can I submit to you today that while we live in a free country, us as Christians also have a liberty and a freedom in Christ that many of us claim to know about, but we really don't understand. Amen. If you don't believe me, just look at the vast majority of Christians who are still in bondage. Look at the vast majority of people who claim to be saved and claim to know what true freedom is, and yet, in reality, they have not truly experienced what it means to be free in Jesus. A lot of Christians are like the foreign man who immigrated from a nation that was under martial law, and the the nation he come from, at, at a certain time every night, the streets had to be clear, people had to be in their houses, and they had a curfew they had to keep. He eventually immigrated to the United States, and when he got to the United States, the first thing he wanted to do was go around to the city he had moved to and start seeing all the beautiful scenery he'd heard about on, on television and in books. And as he was going around, he lost track of time, and he noticed that darkness was beginning to set in, and he started to panic. And he had to find somebody to help him. And he went to a man getting into his car. And he said, sir, can you please get me back to my hotel room? I don't want to miss my curfew and get in trouble. And the man was kind of confused. But then understood the man was foreign. And he started to calm him down. And he said, sir, you need to understand, you're not in that country anymore. You need to understand that that law of that old land don't apply here anymore. He said, you're in the United States of America. You are free to stay out as much and as late as you so desire. The man lived in the land of the free in the United States, but was still living under the bondage of the old country mentality. Can I submit to you today that there's a lot of Christians, a lot of you in this room, who are still living under the bondage of the old country. You're still living with the wrong mindset. You have yet to adapt your thinking to realize you have freedom in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's a lot of people who have yet to understand what it means to be free by the blood and by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. A lot of people's minds have been jaded and have been veiled 
because they have believed a false interpretation of what Christian freedom really looks like. My goal here today is to do my best to lift that veil and explain to you in the best way that the Lord will help me to explain what it means to be free in Jesus. Now, the first way you have to understand freedom is you have to understand freedom comes from a source. Freedom does not just happen. We read these scriptures and we read what the word says about freedom, but yet we have yet to fully comprehend it and understand it. A lot of things that we preach on, we do not, or preach and read on, we don't fully get the concept of what it means. One of those is John 8 and 32. Jesus told them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now when I read that, and I've never seen all the movie, I think of the movie, I think it was the Maybe the Green Mile, I'm not sure, with Tom Cruise and uh, Jack Nicholson. And he said, I want to know the truth. And he said, you can't handle the truth. And y'all didn't like it. That, that's okay. <laughs> but I think that that's what a lot of us don't understand is we want to know the truth so we can be free. But we get to truly grasp what the truth is. Jesus was talking about in John in 8, and he was telling the Jews, he was saying in 831, he said, if you'll abide in my word, then you shall be made free. You shall know this truth. And, and my question is, I always read the Bible with a questioning mindset. Not questioning God, but questioning what does this mean. And I started doing some research, and this comment of Jesus was a twofold comment. He said, number one, if you abide in my word. Well, the word is the word of God. Amen? The first truth that sets you free is the word of God. God's word is the source of ultimate truth. The reason a lot of people in the church and society today are still under bondage is because they have yet to understand that anything God says on a matter is truth, regardless of if you like it or not. His word on abortion that it's wrong is truth, whether you like it or not. His word on homosexual marriage is truth, whether you like it or not. His truth on being, on being racist or being hateful or being offended or being unforgiving, it's truth, whether you like it. Or not. God's word is ultimate truth. All truths originate, all true truths originate from the word of God. And you will only know freedom when you truly know the word of God. But Jesus' other comment did not only point to the written word, but to what the written word pointed to. See, the word, while it is a source of freedom in and of itself, Misty, the word does not only point to itself as a source, but points to the one who is the source. Yes. What are you talking about, Brother Drake? John 5 and 39, Jesus told them, he said, you have these scriptures in which you think eternal life, but these scriptures are those which testify of me. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 21, the entire story of the Bible is leading up to who Jesus is and what he's coming to do. So this truth that sets free is not only the written word of God's ultimate truth, but it's the truth of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. It's the truth of him being the Messiah, the chosen one of God, who has come to bring freedom to all those who are under bondage, to all those who are looking for liberty, to all those held captive by the weight of sin and the world of Satan. The truth that sets free, the source of freedom is Jesus himself. When you find Jesus, you have found freedom. When you find Jesus, you have found the one who is authorized, who has been given the authority, who has been given the keys to get you out of whatever bondage, whatever captivity you are caught up in. Jesus was clear. He is the source and the provider of ultimate freedom. I read it to you in John and Luke chapter 4. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. To be anointed means to be selected by God for a divine and specific purpose. It means to be chosen and been given the authorized authority to do whatever you have been called to do. Jesus was declaring that he had been identified and chosen by God to proclaim freedom to all who were looking 
for it. You have to go to the authorized one. You have to go to the source if you want freedom. Hardly not long ago, I was on the phone with Apple Support, which if you have to do that, God bless your heart. Because there was something wrong with my computer, and I, I, the lady finally answered the phone about five minutes on help. She's a very sweet lady, and you could tell she wanted to help, and I explained the issue to her. And Samantha, she, after I finished my explanation, she said, well, sir, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to transfer you because I'm not authorized to do that. See, she didn't have the authority, she didn't have the anointing, if you will, to fix what I had broken. She transferred me into another girl and the same thing, and about four more times, and about the time I got there, just got a little evangelically ticked off. <laughs> and in the nicest way, but sternest way I could, I said, can you please get me to somebody that is authorized and has the authority to fix my issue? I've got something that's broken, and I need somebody with an authority that can actually fix my broken situation. I don't need somebody that has to go to somebody else that has to go to somebody else. I need somebody with the authority in and of themselves to fix what is broken in my life. And finally, after an hour and a half, I finally got to the manager, to the, the one that could fix it. And what took me an hour and 30 minutes on the phone took him five minutes to fix in and of himself. My situation was fixed, but only when I got to the one, only when I got to the place that had the authority and that had the anointing and had the authorization to give me what I needed. I'm here to tell you today, if you've got some bondage, if you're bound, if you're not free, you've got to come to Jesus because in him there is freedom. In him there is liberty. In him there I'll preach longer. <laughs> Jesus is the only person that can give freedom. Right. The problem is a lot of us have been going to the wrong source. And that's why we're still in bondage. A lot of us have been going to people, to relationships, to the church, if you will, looking for freedom. And they haven't found it because those things in and of themselves do not have the authority and the power to do so. They will not bring you happiness. But I'm here to tell you, if you'll get to the one, if you'll get to the one that he said, I have been duly authorized by God. I have been anointed by the Spirit. I have been given the authority to set you free. If you'll get to Jesus, whatever's holding you back will be broken in Jesus' name. I know what it's like to be in a bondage where you don't know how to find freedom. I know what it's been like to be in a cycle of destruction and doing everything I know, trying my best, going to counseling, going to all other people, talking to the preacher, and still finding no way out. But I'm here to tell you, Brother Eddie, when I got down on my knees and I said, Jesus, I tried it on my own. I tried it by myself. I've got to have you. Can I tell you that? Of our freedom. If you want freedom, you gotta come to Jesus. If you want to be set free, you gotta come to Him because He's the only one that can do it. While it's important to know the source of your freedom, I believe a lot of us understand who you have to go to to get freedom, but a lot of us don't understand exactly what Jesus' freedom looks like. <laughs> See, we're like that foreigner I talked about who had yet to adapt his mind and get his thinking on what had just occurred for him. See, we, we, a lot of us are in bondage to things because we have limited freedom. We've limited it with our own interpretation. We've limited it with our own understanding. And a lot of us think when we talk about freedom that freedom only relates to our eternal life. We only relate it to salvation. We talk about, yes, Jesus saved me. He saved me from death. He saved me from hell. And I have an eternal life in heaven. I'm not diminishing that. That's the most important part of our freedom. But can I tell you that Jesus' freedom is much deeper? Amen. 
Can I tell you that the freedom Jesus has come to give us entails a whole lot more than just having an eternal life in heaven. Jesus did not come just to set us free in eternity and change our eternal life. He came to change our physical life and our life here on earth. In John 10, 10, he said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. Life more abundantly means life without restriction. Life without lack. It means a life that is overflowing with life and more life. Life and more life. He said, I didn't just come for you to have an eternal life. I've come so that you can have a good life here. He said, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. Scripture is clear that freedom not only relates to eternity, but to our abundant life as well. His Jesus' death and resurrection gave us victory and freedom over every power and every bondage that would seek to hold us in captivity. His freedom applies to every area of our lives. I quoted it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. Therefore, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And that indeed is not just an exclamation. He's not just saying, indeed, you'll be free. That word indeed, it means to com be complete. It means fully. It means without restriction. It means truly. So when he said you shall be free and free indeed, he said you shall be free and completely free. You shall be free and totally free. You shall be free without any bondage, without any restriction, without anything. If I get on this floor, I'm good for 45 minutes. He said, you shall be free and totally free indeed. That means he did not leave any stone unturned. That he came to bring total freedom, spirit, mind, and body. He gave complete freedom. His freedom left nothing undone. He did not come and perform a halfway work. His work is complete. But yet we still don't grasp that. What does that look like, Brother Drake? I'm going to give you three points and I'm out of your way. These, do, these are not all encompassing. There's so much more, but these are the highlights. Because I think if you can grasp these three things, then you can experience the true freedom Christ has come to give you. The first thing he has set us free from is the debt of sin. You ever had a debt that you cannot pay off? Hello, somebody. A mortgage, a car payment, a credit card bill. Some of you ladies just got real squinched up when I said that. <laughs> you ever had something that you, no matter what you did, you could not pay it off? You did everything in your power, but nothing seemed to make a dent in it. That's exactly what sin is. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, I gotta get down here on the floor, I'm sorry. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they incurred a debt to all humanity that we could not pay on our own. They incurred a debt that no action, no good work, no righteousness of mankind could satisfy the debt of sin. Amen. Every one of us were born into sin. David said, even in my mother's womb, I was, I was conceived in it anyway. You were born into this sinful world. You were born with a sinful flesh. You were born with a sinful nature. And you had a debt all throughout the Old Testament. They tried to sacrifice animal after animal. But all it was was the layaway plan. All it was was just preventing the debt collector until the next year on the Day of Atonement. They did all they could, Sister Tina, but none, even a thousand animals, their blood would not suffice because we owed a debt to a holy God. And a holy God can not diminish the debt to an unholy people. And so the only way that it could be paid, the only way it could be satisfied is by God himself coming down in the form of his son and shedding his own blood and setting us free and taking away the debt of sin. Colossians 2.14 says that he has erased the credit of sin and we are free in Jesus and he's nailed it to the cross. Jesus came so that our debt could be satisfied. His blood was the seal on the credit. His blood was the thing that said pay in full. And because of him, we're no longer under the sin, uh, sin law. We are no longer condemned but justified. We have been justified by faith in Christ Jesus. And we no longer are sinful and unholy, but righteous sons and daughters through the blood of Christ Jesus our Lord. 
He set us free from the debt of sin. His blood sealed it, and that's all it took. You're no longer under that debt. It's been paid, written off, every bit of it. Every lie, every murder, every angry moment, every fornicating action, every lustful thought, every cheating dealing, everything you've ever done from birth until now is covered under the blood and you no longer have to worry about how am I going to pay you because he's done it for you. You've been made free from the dead of sin. Not only that, I'm over my 25 minutes, oh well. Sorry. Not only has he freed us from the debt of sin, but he's freed us from the power of sin. Aren't those two in the same? No, they're not. Because see, here's the thing. There's some people that while they realize Jesus died for our sin, they did not understand that Jesus has subdued and stripped sin of all of its power. See, when Jesus said, I have been anointed to preach liberty to the captives. That word captive means one who's been taken as a prisoner of war. A captive means somebody who has been enslaved and who was under an obligation to a cruel, abusive master. Can I tell you that when we were unsaved, we had an obligation to sin? Hello, somebody. When we were not under the covenant, we had an obligation to the master of sin. You had to give in to temptation because you were sin slaves. You had to obey its lustful, desirous command because you belong to sin. But when Jesus came, I'm about to get happy and run if y'all don't help me. When Jesus came, not only did he take the sin debt away, but Romans said that the law and the spirit of Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. That means I'm no longer obligated to give in to sin when it tells me to do something wrong. That means I'm no longer obligated to give in to lustful temptations and go and do wrong. I'm no longer a slave to sin, but I'm made righteous, I'm made whole, and I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. The word tells us that he has come to subdue all powers. It tells us in Colossians that he made a spectacle of them, meaning he chained them down. He took away their authority. They no longer have the right to hold us captive. But a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand that when you get saved, your debt has not only been taken care of and paid for, you no longer have to sin. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen on that. Amen. We have made the excuse for years, I'm just human. Amen. Right. And we excuse all sorts of sinful fleshly activity because I'm just human. That excuse is never once found in Scripture. Amen. The Bible says he knows we are the flesh, but he never excused it. Hello? He never excused it. A lot of people don't understand that when sin and temptation rises, you have the right to resist it. When you were unsaved, you had to give in to it because you were free from the law of God and you were bound to the law of sin. But now that you have been transferred, you are obligated to the law of righteousness and no longer under the power of sin. See, the reason why, and I'm going to say this, you can get mad at me if you want to. The reason why some of us have not grasped the reality that sin is powerless is because we keep giving the power back to it. We keep handing it back into authority. I can't, I'm not strong enough. I can't make it through this. God, I don't understand. Yes, he does understand. The Bible says in Hebrews, we do not have a high priest that is ignorant to our suffering, but in every way was tempted as we were, yet without sin. The Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 10 that there is no temptation that has overtaken you such as common demand, but God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but in every temptation will make a way of 
escape. See, the reason why some of us have not comprehended that sin no longer has power is because we ignore the door of escape and we keep feeding the monster of sin. Because we like it. But if you want to be free, if you want to know what freedom in Christ truly looks like, you need to understand that sin nature, while it may tell you you have to give in, it's a liar and it has no more authority. It has no more power. It cannot demand you to do anything because Jesus said, I have been anointed to proclaim liberty. That means to set, that means to free from obligation, free from restraint. He said, I have freed you from sin's dominion and rule. You don't have to sin. Next time that temptation comes up, you need to realize you don't have to give in to it. He has made us free and free indeed. At that point, sin becomes your choice. He has set us free from the debt of sin. He set us free from the power of sin. The last thing, and this is Real big, I think. Not only has he set us free from sin's debt and sin's power, but he set us free from the strongholds of sin. There's a lot of things in the church that are hindering people from living their spiritual walk, but I think the biggest one is a lot of people find themselves in bondages and in strongholds. See, strongholds are something that the enemy can set up when you're unsaved and that sometimes can continue after because you did not, you have not come to the realization that they can be demolished. A stronghold in your life is something that is strong, so strong and so fortified that you had it all your life and you've done all you can do and you just feel at this point you're saved and you want to get rid of it. You want to get out of this habit. You want to get out of this cycle. But everything you do, you can't find that freedom. You can't seem to get away from it. You just cannot seem to get out of that, that cycle of going, of being blind bound and going round and round. You just can't seem to get out of that rut. And you're in this stronghold and you've almost come to the point that you've accepted it as part of who you are. That you, you're saying that this is just your cross to bear. That this is just your thorn in the flesh. That you've got to go through with this. Honey, I'm here to tell you that Jesus did not only come to take us and make us free from sin. He came to free us from all power, all principalities, all bondages, all chains, all strongholds. There's nothing that Jesus' blood has not come to set us free from. He come to free us from all powers of darkness and flesh. Even if that stronghold was by your choice. I live, and I don't mind telling you this, I'm free from it, so praise God. Some of you have heard this, some of you haven't, if you have, bear with it. I know what it's like to be in a bondage for six years. The worst bondage I could ever think of, the bondage of pornography. Actually, seven years. Every day, trying to find a way out. Every day, Misty, looking for that door and finding it some days. But other days, you know, I just, just couldn't get to it. That, 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 that chain, Sister Tristan, was a short chain. I could get to the door, but couldn't reach the knob. It was by my own choosing when I was 11 years old. And I hated myself every day for it. Especially after I got saved at 16. I hated myself. Did not understand. And I knew God's grace was sufficient. I quoted it to him all the time. And it's not that I don't believe he tried to help me. I believe he did all that he could because that's what his word tells me to do. What I believe is because of my own choices. Because I chose sin every time. I stayed in a stronghold that could be broken years ago. Because not only was I choosing to sin, but I had not come to the full realization that while my sin was dirty and while it did not please God, it was still not too big for him to break. I had a viewpoint, Brother Bill, 
that those walls were so tall that I honestly thought, I'm going to suffer with this for the rest of my life. Brother Gene, I honestly, it was, so, it was such a deep, dark prison that I thought, there's no way out of this. I'll never find it. But I told you earlier, I finally got to the point where one day I knelt in my bed and I said, Lord, I'm tired of dealing with it. Lord, I'm tired of being condemned. I'm tired of living below my privileges. And if you, if you will, I know you can break this chain. I know there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And God, if you'll do it now, I promise I'll never open another door for me to go down that aisle. And can I tell you, in that moment, the chains fell off. In that moment, can I tell you that the prison door, which had already been open, swung open, and I walked out of that jail free and sanctified and made more holy than I had been before. See, there are some of you who don't realize you're stuck in a habit and you're stuck in a mindset because you have not fully comprehended the fact that Jesus has opened your door. The jail cell of your life has been unlocked. The door might be closed, but the Bible says in Revelation 1.18 that he holds the keys to hell and death. That means all you've got to do is start walking. And once you push the door, you can be free and free in There is no bondage. There is no sin. There is no stronghold that the Lord cannot break. Amen. If he can destroy sin and, and strip it of its power, then he has come to strip whatever habit and whatever mindset you have of its power as well. Amen. You can be free and free indeed when you give it. To be free, you cannot be self-sufficient. Somebody didn't hear that. Every stronghold, no matter what it looks like, no matter how dark, no matter how deep in the prison you are, when he said, I have been anointed to set at liberty, he said to release from the restraints those who are oppressed. The oppressed means one who has been thrown in the deepest, darkest prison with no hope of exit. But he said, I have been chosen, I have been anointed to set at liberty, to release the chains, to open the jail cell doors to all in the deepest, darkest stronghold they can imagine. That means he's come to set you free from anxiety. He's come to set you free from pornography. He's come to set you free from alcoholism and drug addiction. He's come to set you free from all chains of the sin and flesh. All you've got to do is come to him. It's that simple. He's come to take you out of the deepest, darkest cell. Whatever that rut, that circle you've been in for all of your life, it can be broken in Jesus' name. He's the source. He's the anointed one. I can't do it. You in and of yourself cannot. But he did. We need to understand, Misty, I'm almost done here. Are you ready? I didn't do too bad. <laughs> we need to understand. While this is not an all comprehensive list, I believe it pretty much covers the basics. I don't know about you, but when I come to that realization that not only has my sin debt been paid, but that sin no longer has power over me and that any stronghold sin has tried to build can be destroyed, Sister Betty, what do I have to be afraid of? If in Jesus I'm free and free indeed, then why should I live in a bondage mentality? See, some of you need to, the first thing you need to do with freedom is strip yourself of that victim mentality. You need to strip yourself and think and strip your mind of that thought that, well, this is just who I am. 
I can't get free from this. I'll just suffer with it till Jesus comes. Honey, no. Jesus said that in John 8, he said, the, the slave does not abide in the house. He said, I think it's 835, the slave is not the one that abides in the house, but the son abides forever. You, I want to say this and say this nicely. You will never fully comprehend and fully experience being a son or daughter of God still living in bondage to death. Because you'll always be with it. There will always be restraints. You've seen the movies where they have house servants, and only certain house servants were allowed in certain areas. But the sons, the daughters, the heirs to the kingdom were allowed wherever they wanted. Some of you need to strip yourself of that mentality that Satan has put in your mind and made you think you're limited. And make you think that you're at your, your talking point, that you've reached your cap level. I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar. He's the father of all lies. There is more in Jesus. There's more than just suffering till Jesus comes. There's more than just fighting bondages. You can walk in victory and you can walk in freedom and you can be free from every jail cell. All you got to do is step out and take it. I want everybody to bow their head and close their eyes. <coughs> Maybe if you will, go ahead and shut the video off. <coughs>